And now we have David uh, with the next session on how do we improve the experience of contributors and maintainers. Uh, yep. Let me go ahead and share my screen. All right. So hopefully this should work. Let me perhaps uh, hmm, refresh. Yes, we see your uh, presentation or sharing screen. Great. Yeah. Uh, so it's not it's not really a presentation. I don't have anything to present here. Um, the intent is uh, to to chat a little bit, uh, and I and I hope uh, anyone is free to jump in. Um, one of the things that I uh, take personally to heart, let's say, uh, even uh, if the the rest of the team also cares about this, is how how we can make uh, the experience of contributors and maintainers easier. Um, this, you know, I, I could I could extend this to any um, hosting of Ansible content, whether it's roles, modules, plugins, uh, playbooks, and so on. Um, I'll be I'll be focusing a little bit about uh, around um, Ansible Ansible and uh, collections. Uh, but you hit, if you have any. Uh, tips, advice, questions, feedback. Uh, I'd be happy to hear them. Um, I did. I did add some stuff in the CI and tooling section. I didn't have time to to add some topics here, uh, but hopefully it's not just me. It's you uh, and the rest of the community. Uh, so um, we can we can uh, you know add stuff in there and talk about it. Um, we don't we don't have a bunch of time, uh, but you know a short session and. This will be recorded, and uh, <coughs> sorry, um, and it's also you know something that we can use to as a base to you know um, uh, focus our prioritize what we should be working on over the next few weeks, next few months, uh, to make um, people's lives easier, basically, right? But also, if there's any uh, any stuff that you're really happy with that are working well for you, uh, I'd be happy to write that down too. Um, and you know, if um, because well, if it's working out for you, maybe we should recommend it or promote it and or document it and you know talk about it more. Um, so um, you know, uh, over to you. Um, any anyone wants to uh, chat? Well, I'll start. <laughs> yes. Um, so I just wanted to propose a slight modification there. I mean, not mod addition, not modification. It can be difficult sometimes for people to work in hypotheticals. This comes up a lot when we do surveys, um, which this isn't, but it's close. And so asking people, what should we do, is a harder question than what have you experienced, right? So you've already touched on that by saying what's worked well for you, but it might be easy to ask what has not worked well, rather than what should we do to fix it which is a hypothetical and requires you to understand the, the constraints on the teams that we have and the technologies that we've got and so on. Um, rather than that, where, where, can we ask the question, what has hurt you? What has blocked you? What has been a bad experience for you? Uh, and then we can decide what to do with that information. Right? As, a, as a community, we can look at that and say, well, here's a potential solution right, that we think we can make work. Mm -hmm. um, just, just That's just how I'd word it. So I just wanted to throw that in there in case people uh, felt that was easier to answer. Yeah, maybe you know. Um, I get. I guess uh, what we're trying to find out is, um, is is there is there anything we could do? You know, um, not just the Ansible community team, in, but in the fairness, Ansible community at large. In fairness, this is better format for asking hypothetical questions because we can talk about it. And surveys, it's a really bad idea because what you'll do is you'll send out a survey, and you'll get a whole bunch of stuff back that you can't act on, and it's too late at that point because the survey's done, right? So. The back and forth we can have here is much better, uh, but I just wanted to, to like just give some people some some things to play around with. I'm going to shut up because we're limited on time. <laughs> uh, so you know, uh, whenever you send a patch to uh, an Ansible uh, project, Ansible collection, or Ansible core, um, you know, how is that working out for you? Um, are you getting reviews in time? Are you uh, Pretend the CI fails um, or the job fails. Do you know how to troubleshoot them? Are you struggling with that? You know, this is the kind of stuff that we want to talk about.
this, this is a topic that's really dear to my heart for those of you that have known me for this. Well, one thing I'd like to ask maybe is for, for those of you, because I, I think about 50% of the people in this uh, call today, this is their first contributor to something, which is amazing, right, that we're, you've decided to get in, involved and understand a bit more. So for those people that are new to contributing to Ansible, if I could wave a magic wand and fix one thing, what would that one thing be? What is what is difficult, right? What is where's the learning curve? What is the thing that's annoyed you? Um, so feel free to put stuff in chat or just unmute your microphone and and and, and talk to me. <laughs> you know, I can I can break the ice here uh, and say um, or something that I've seen in the community. Um, specifically in, in regards to collections was um, needing uh, needing the collections to be in a specific path you know under ansible underscore collections um, but you know I don't I don't know where that fits in uh, in terms of you know uh, that's more of a a constraint on how the core ansible tests work but I just trying to stir up some discussion here. Or you know, I can I can move on to the CI and tooling part because that's the part where I'm more I'm most uh, familiar with. Um, well, I think I can raise. Um, well, I can kind of agree with your sort of um, you know having to put it under Ansible collections, but but it's actually just there is a general problem. Um, which is fairly common across most open source projects. And that is when you're trying to contribute, there are a bunch of assumptions that are being made about test environments or, or uh, sort of things that you have to have ready in order to actually do something. Um, or, or even, you know, how to run the tests in the first place. Um, and uh, to a greater or lesser degree, that, that is a bit of a problem, right? It's how do you get set up so that you can actually do your first PR um, in a way that's going to make you most successful. Uh, because you can just write up your PR, figure out how to use Git, submit the PR. Yay, you, you've submitted. But then you're going to get barraged by a bunch of failing tests. Um, and if you go and ask someone for help on RMC, you may or may not have a good experience as a result of that. Um, so. The, to me, the, the first problem always to solve is what are the assumptions um, for that, that need to be in place in order to actually get the your initial successful job done? Um, yep. I think that, community that, that's... General has done a fairly good job of, of keeping on top of that. Um, it, it, it's it's a problem that's hard to solve because uh, when you're spreading across many collections, everybody makes different assumptions. So, mm -hmm. you know, I, I think I think you make a great point. Um, I, I do I do want to point out um, there is um, something called uh, Katakoda where we have um, it's a short scenario that uh, I invite new contributors to look at. Um, basically, it walks you through the process of oh. No, <laughs> uh, I don't know how to get rid of this. <laughs> but um, it, in short, it, it walks you through the process interactively of checking out uh, collections code, um, modifying it. Uh, there's a bug in the collection, uh, and you need to fix it, basically. Uh, but working through the scenario interactively tells you about uh, Ansible tests. It tells you about um, the path where it needs to be checked out. So it, it does some of those basic things, um, and would be happy to improve that to cover more use cases or even have other scenarios that uh, you know we can write all the documentations we want, but people learn in different ways uh, and understand in different ways, and you know that's okay. Um, but, so we do have this Katakoda scenarios that um, people can look at. Um, maybe someone can drop a link in the chat or something. Yeah, well, I see this mostly as a documentation problem because uh, I'll just post a link. Uh, I help maintain a few collections, 
And one of the first things we always do is create a, a hacking document or something that instructs users how to set, set up their environment so they can start working or playing with the collection. And because there is no such place in collection documentation, it's hard to start working on the collection when you first see it. So, for example, if you want to make a change in, I would, I don't know, community digital ocean, there is no specific instructions for that collection, how to set up the environment and how to get up and running, I would say in five or 10 minutes or so. So, yeah, you said we learn differently. We all have different um, uh, preferred ways of acquiring knowledge, but even if those that do want to read the documentation, they don't have, a, I would say, a canonical way of getting to the documentation. You need to browse through GitHub repository. Hopefully, there is some information in the readme file, but more often than not, you probably your best bet is probably to pop to the ears and hope someone will help you get through the initial struggle of setting up the environment, explaining a few things. Helping you, helping you debug the your environment and so on and so forth. So, this is what I see as the I would say it's problematic because the users don't have information they need, and it's pro problematic for the uh, collection maintainers because we don't have a place to put that information and get it to the users or to the potential con uh, contributors. Uh, the link I show, we use some hacked process to generate docu documentation for our collection, but uh, not all collections have resources or not all maintainers have resources to invest in such a documentation site because there are no official tools or no, again, no official processes of how to generate collection documentation and generate them a documentation site, um, for example. So, but as I said, this is, what I see is the most problematic part of the collections. So how to document non-reference things in collections. So we do have covered uh, module documentation, uh, so examples and such, uh, such thing, but there is no place for general information. So scenario guides, uh, setup guides and uh, such things. I, I think I think you make a great point, Talboro. And I remember uh, Brian Test uh, asked on IRC, um, I want to say maybe last week or the week before, um, basically the same thing. Like, well, is there a standardized place to put? Not because we, we have we have a lot of docs around Ansible and how to use the modules, how to use the plugins, and so on. But not so much about um, how to contribute to individual collections, like how to release it, and so on. Um, he, I, I believe he, uh, and he ended up uh, using a GitHub wiki for the collection, but since it's not standardized, um, you know, people might not have the reflex to look at the wiki or know where to look in the first place. So I think I think uh, that's a good that's a good thing to write down. Yeah, I like that. So to maybe drill down in it a little bit, I'm wondering if every collection. Because if you if you think about the end user experience, right, the developer experience, their starting point is going to be the collection repo. It's not going to be some random place on docs Ansible or com. So I'm wondering if the re, if every collection readme, so therefore it's displayed when you look at the GitHub repo, it should mention the contributing file, or or maybe just go to the readme. It should have a link to the general um, guide about how to. Do collection development, and we can put a link into the Catacoda scenario that um, David mentioned earlier. So, general purpose and so general collection information, and then also the readme should have any details specific about this specific collection. For example, you talked about DigitalOcean. Well, does it require a Python library, or where do you put your credentials, or is there anything you just need to be mindful? Is that sort of what you're thinking? Yeah, so basically there is some general information on how to start developing collections, but since the collections are designed by, the, by their maintainers, so for example, uh, I am the principal maintainer of the Sensu Go collection and we do uh, certain things our way. We still follow the general procedures or general, uh, we follow the good practices community has, but we do them in 
a slightly different way because we found it that it is easier to set up the local environment uh, that way. So, for example, we use Makefile that contains targets for most common operations. For example, Ansible content team, I know mostly decided to use stocks um, to guide the, the, the general processes and that to integrate the talks with the CI and CD. So this is the information I feel it is missing from the, not missing from the general documentation. It, it is not even destined to be the part of the general documentation. General documentation is there and has quite a lot of information but information about specific processes, about the specific collection is something that is currently hard to find. And to, as I said, it is, it is simple to start working with collections in general. It is rather hard to start work, working on a specific collection that is not community maintained, for example, because it uses some different uh, processes to manage the content. So this is the problem I see. And this is the problem we try to address when we write the hacking documentation. So getting started documentation, testing, integration testing, unit testing, and so on and so forth. Yeah, that, that makes sense. We'll, we'll find out if there's a way to address that. Yeah, so uh, I can see uh, a solution over here. So we can uh, formulate a guideline where we can tell every collection owner or collection maintainers that these are the set of guidelines that we should follow uh, regarding the CI or toolings or uh, these kind of things. So that can be one, one of the solutions to uh, have these kind of things. We, we, I, ca I can see us encouraging, um, um, encouraging collections to, you know, um, document better, you know, how um, how to contribute to the collection, but also how to release it, and because not, not all the collections are released the same way, and you know some of the other specifics. Um, from I, I don't know if you want to get into the waters of requiring uh, this because it, it, it implies that you know uh, well it's a requirement that you need to do it, and um, but you know we'll have the opportunity to talk about it. Yeah, so uh, definitely. So when we uh, enforce something, people might not be comfortable with a certain set of tooling. Like uh, uh, you might be uh, interested to have make file in your uh, collection. Or if I am very comfortable with talks, then I'm very re reluctant to have a make file uh, in my collection. So uh, I feel like there is a, uh, a way of improvement over there. So we can always discuss and improve over there. Yeah. Yep. I mean, different tools uh, for different purposes and also people have their own preferences. And I think I think that's Got fine. Um, Got it. All right. Cool. Uh, we're I, I think we're about out of time. Uh, Carol, how are we doing on time? We are right at 20 minute mark. OK. But, um, um, the, what, what's after this is, is a longer break. So if this, you know, the, the discussion is going well, we can continue for another five minutes. Yeah, uh, I mean, uh, otherwise, uh, you know, this is a living document. Uh, anyone can edit it at any time. Uh, so even after these, uh, <laughs> this session is finished, uh, I encourage you to uh, fill in this. Um, and again, we'll, we'll use it to um, have a, a better idea of where to steer our efforts, um, you know, in the next few weeks and months. I'm, I'm just oh, sorry, uh, one more addition from my side. I'm just a little bit puzzled why we are talking about documenting collections when not even the official how to develop a collection document is complete. So there, is still, there, is still, there are still three sections in the official how to develop a collection documentation that are not filled in, that are marked with to be done. Can you, can you drop a link in the chat and we can look into that? Yeah, of course, of course. Thanks. You know, it's the kind of stuff that we want to that we want to um, improve. So, it, it, by all means, do do point out if you if you think there are things that are missing or still working progress know, and, and stuff like that. For me, it's it's quite hard to write a documentation or even to provide a collection when, for example, the the part of providing a playbook in a collection is not even documented. Okay. 
Um, I, I know for a fact that, um, here we go, and someone, please correct me if I'm wrong, but starting with Ansible Core 2.11, shipping next month, uh, it'll be possible to call a playbook by the collection name. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, so you don't need to specify the entire path of the playbook. It's, it's not only about documentation, it's also about tooling. For example, Ansible, role, uh, Ansible Galaxy in it role currently um, also provides a tests directory and a readme MD. Is it reasonable to have an additional readme MD, MD in some subdirectories in the collection or even the meta main YAML? So are you, are you saying that when you when you do an init collection, it doesn't not, not provide the same a, a role in it? The official yeah. tool to provide a skeleton for a new role is Ansible uh, Galaxy init role mm -hmm. or role in it, which currently creates a lot of boilerplates that is no longer needed in collections because the Galaxy YAML is already providing some of this stuff. Yeah, OK. Yeah. So, so so these are the, the problems that I have with collections. And therefore, I'm seeing this actually, even now with Ansible 3.0 as a tech preview. Interesting. OK. Thanks for pointing that out. Because the tooling and the documentation for the collection thingy seems not to be complete. I'm, I'm not sure where I can support you there. Uh, but uh, I have I have very hard time to explain a customer that he should use the documentation where somebody has stated to be done. Yeah, and, yeah, that's fair. It's really good feedback, right? You know, we don't expect everyone to tell you know to go and raise a pull request in, in detail like this is exactly what's missing. Mm -hmm. Or raising issues. Uh, I can I can open a pull request, but I don't know exactly where because this sure. documentation is missing too. Yeah. <laughs> But like, yeah, that's it. And that's a good fair point. But like, raising a GitHub issue to say, I wanted to solve this problem, but I didn't know how. And these are the things I struggled on, which implies either the documentation doesn't exist or there's a discoverability issue as in we're not linking to it. That, that's really good feedback. And that's something that we can, we can, we can work with. Yeah, OK. Maybe you can, can address this in, in the link proposals also. Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah. Don't don't worry about where where to raise the issue, right? We 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 can move issues around. We can copy and paste them in, right? The main thing is that we collect this feedback and then we can then we can do something with it. Yeah, uh, I will attend the, the the meetings the next time anyway. Maybe I can raise my voice there again. <laughs> That'd be brilliant. Yeah, well, feel free to to reach out to me directly on IRC or uh, yeah. com. Thanks a lot. So uh, hopefully nobody is angry at me that I've consumed a little bit of the break time. <laughs> no, no, uh, no, sorry. I mean, that's why we're here. Yeah, it's really, really good feedback. Thank you. Uh, I have a question for Daniel. Uh, so Daniel, uh, you mentioned uh, creating roles in conjunction with collections. Mm -hmm. And uh, doing collection in it creates some skeleton. And uh, the, do I understand correctly that you meant creating additional roles in the roles directory that collections have? Um, so when I'm doing a, a collection in it, it creates a skeleton for collections where I can create a roles directory according to the documentation. And in this role directory, roles directory, I want to create additional roles. A typical use case, for example, is now for the Ansible Podman collection where I want to have example roles in to showcase how the Ansible collection for Portman is working. Uh, okay, so I, I'm really struggling. How should the meta main YAML look like? Should there be a readme or not? <laughs> okay, so I was right. You were talking about creating roles that uh, exist inside of a collection. Exactly. Yep, because it, it was not completely clear. Mm -hmm. uh, same for playbooks. Yeah. And same for playbooks. OK, so uh, you are talking about missing docs, uh, mm -hmm. uh, about creating some specific types of content inside of collections, not exactly. the exactly. top level collection structure. No, no, it's okay, the great. top level yeah. collections. The Galaxy YAML is wonderfully documented. It's the parts yeah. in it that are lacking. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. That, that's what I wanted to clarify. Mm -hmm. That's great. Thank you. Oh, the Galaxy YAML is wonderfully documented. It's, it's absolutely understandable. And same for plugin development. It's, it's 
awesome. I can work with it. Not an issue. It's for roles and playbooks and, and the arc spec thingy that is, was already mentioned in the chat. Hopefully, yeah. with 2.11, there will be more. Yeah, thanks for the feedback. I got it. All right, this is definitely a, a hot topic uh, as expected. It, it won't be, you know, we, we don't have all the answers definitely right now, but um, please feel free to continue the discussions. And, uh, but for now, we will take a longer break. Uh, we were supposed to start at uh, 20 past, so uh, it's about, you know, we'll have like a 52 minute break. And in the meantime, also, talking about contributions and stuff, um, one of the things is, you know, the major thing is the communication channels, the mediums. So uh, we, we are discussing ways of maybe making things more accessible in addition to IRC. So I will put some poll questions during the break. Feel free to answer them at your own time. Um, and um, we will see you back in about 52 minutes. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Um, I, I'll, I'll be in the chat um, on both IRC and, and Google Meet, so feel free to, to keep chatting. Yeah, feel free to continue the conversations. Thanks. It's all really interesting. So we do this survey after the summit each time. So I've got three survey sets of data, and I'll have four shortly, since I'll be sending one out at the end of this week. Um, and one of the questions we talk about is what what is getting in the way of people contributing to the community. And the top two generally, and they switch which is number one, which is number two, but they're, they're very similar, are uh, not having enough time, which is the ideal one to have in the first place because it's the one we can't fix. Um, and the second one is process, right? So if we can improve those processes, if we can remove speed bumps, Right, that's fine. The other things are things like don't want to write tests or um, or you know there's people being nasty to me so I don't want to contribute. Like that one is always last, which is extremely good to hear. Um, and by a long, long way. Uh, but you know it's it's interesting that things like not having like not having steps uh, that, you know having steps that you don't want to do is way below like just not understanding the process. Um, so that's that's absolutely where this feedback helps, right? It's like, and um, you know, I'm hearing it here. In, in other words, like people saying they can't find the documentation, or the documentation not written, or you know, there's problems with, with maybe there's better tooling we can do. It's all it's all part of the process, right? Yeah. It's really interesting to see the survey data coming through like that. Yeah, you know, you mentioned you mentioned tests, and this is something that I've heard about also. Um, even myself, not as a you know, I, I can I can write Python, but you know, when you get into the weeds of writing Python unit tests, um, it's not it's not always easy or trivial when you need to mock interfaces and things like that. Um, but it, it turns out that you know the things that you cannot test with unit tests, you can do with integration tests. And uh, integrate since integration tests, at least for um, you know, generally speaking, uh, they are written as Ansible roles and playbooks. So those are much easier to write, and they they test that your thing actually works uh, the way that you intended to, without necessarily getting into the weeds of unit testing. So you're not going to have you know perfect 100% coverage, but um, you know it would it would uh, it's a, at least something you know to minimal amount of test coverage. Yeah, yeah, it'll be interesting to see uh, on the assumption that we improve process, which I'm sure we want to do, um, then. It will be interesting to see if tests comes up because that was just not as important as the process getting in the way, or whether actually what you say is like, you know, what I'm hearing from you there is like actually the test can be pretty straightforward because you can write them in this style, and maybe tests will always stay low, right? Because it's actually not that big a deal. Um, I don't know. We'll have to wait and see. Uh, but it'll be interesting to see which one. Uh, that, that, that's obviously assuming we fix the other things that are in the way. Um, but yeah. It's, it's, it's always fun watching how data evolves. And the nice thing is that um, the tooling I use accounts for that, so I can combine multiple surveys. Because we only get small samples, right? Yes, we've got a nice big community. Um, but you know, these these events are small. Um, and that's to be expected. So I might, I'm, I'm generally happy if I get like 50 plus responses to the survey. Um, and some of those will be from people who didn't come, so we can find out why not, so we can make it more accessible next time. So you know, I have to be able to combine these surveys together uh, and that 
and that, and then you have to account for like drift over time and things like that. So it's, it's, it's good fun. Uh, well, I think it's good fun. Anyway. <laughs> but uh, yeah, um, it will be interesting to see what happens as we as we improve the processes and particularly uh, work on like now that the docs split, the big doc splits happened, and I guess there's a, I don't know, Sandra will probably correct me here because I'm talking out of turn, but um, like being able to see what they work on next and hopefully like fix a lot of that would be great. Welcome back to Ansible Contributor Summit. Uh, the next session we will have is Brad and Ganesh talking about Ansible Network Collections Update. Brad and Ganesh, are you there? Yeah. Hey, everybody. Uh, let me present. Uh, let me bring this up real quick. Is that visible? I, okay, it's loading, and I see it now. All right. Well, hey, everyone. My name is Brad Thornton. I am a senior principal engineer on the Ansible uh, content team. My focus is primarily uh, has been uh, networking over the past uh, two years. I've been with Red Hat for two years. <clears throat> so what I want to go over today is just want to provide everybody an update uh, in the networking space, and then I want to talk about uh, an ancillary collection that we have called Ansible Utils. Uh, I'm not sure I have 20 minutes of content, so we'll leave some time for, for questions. Um, network resource module development continues. If you're not familiar with uh, you know, what a network resource module is, these are fairly opinionated, structured Ansible modules that transform native configuration text from EOS, NXOS, iOS, Junos, BIOS, iOS, XR network devices into structured data. And uh, also will transform that structured data back into native configuration text. Uh, the way that we, is, we have broken these out, if you're a networking person, is they're largely based on uh, an individual resource or sometimes a section of the configuration. Uh, they guarantee idempotent operations. They've got a number of different states that I'll talk about, um, such as merged, replaced, overridden, deleted. Uh, we're adding a new one. Um, so the current focus right now for the first part of this year is to really round out the routing support in the networking space. Last, last year, we released uh, OSPF and OSPF interfaces. Um, BGP is out now. We've got BGP address family, uh, route map support, and prefix list support is in the works. There are proposals for the data models for these things. I will track those down and pass them along. Um, and again, we develop these uh, across all the platforms we support. So for instance, uh, BGP Global, <clears throat> which configures the BGP Global configuration, has been released for uh, each of the platforms, EOS, NXOS, iOS, Junos, BIOS. Uh, the reason we've taken that approach is we know that uh, Ansible users tend to have more than one platform. So as they're adopting resource modules, you can adopt the BGP resource module across some of the most uh, popular platforms that are out there. So those are all in the works. Uh, we've got some enhancements to the network resource modules that are in work. Uh, we have been asked on more than one occasion um, what network resource modules are, what network resource modules are available? We've updated the documentation on Galaxy to kind of highlight which resource modules are available. We're actually going to add a new key to each of the platform fax modules that will expose which network resource modules are available. So an example there would be the EOS fax key. You can ask for available network resources, and we'll provide a list of the available resource modules for that platform. Uh, the part of the reason we're doing that is just to, to surface the scope and the number of resource modules we have available, but also you'll be able to use that information programmatically within loops in your playbooks to iterate through uh, a list of modules or a list of files within a role to deploy sections of your configuration. Um, the current states, I mentioned this earlier for resource modules, merged, replaced, overridden, deleted. Um, those are configuration operations, configuration management states, uh, gathered and rendered. 
uh, are two interesting ones. Gathered is uh, a way to pull back that native configuration text and get it back as structured data. So it is really uh, there to collect your configuration. Rendered works in the opposite direction of gathered. You can provide configuration text and the resource module will transform it to structured data. Both gathered and rendered, neither of those modules, neither of those states, excuse me, will modify your configuration. So they're super handy during you know, playbook development, vetting out resource modules, testing configuration changes. Um, parsed, uh, actually parsed and rendered are the two bi-directional from structured text and back gathered pulls the current. The one that we just added um, is a state called purged. This was triggered by the way we structured the BGP modules. So if you think about a classic BGP configuration on a network device, you've got the global configuration and then contained within it, you may have some additional address families. Uh, we were asked, uh, how do I remove the entirety of the BGP config? Uh, this is where the purged state comes in. It will remove the entire BGP config from the network device, both uh, the, the scope of the configuration that was handled by both the global module and the address family. So you'll see that in the, the BGP modules come to, come to surface. Um, the Ansible net common collection is kind of the, the back end of the platform modules. Um, a couple new things that have been added in the 2.0 release, which I think came out two weeks ago uh, and will be included in the uh, Ansible package 4.0. Um, there's a configuration that allows for caching. We call this single user mode. Uh, and what this does is if you issue the same show command on the device more than one time, we will not go back to the device to get the output for the show command. Uh, <clears throat> the reason we're able to do that is we can track and we have knowledge of when the configuration has changed from Ansible's perspective. So the name single user mode was very intentional here because this is really for use in a production environment when there's only one system making a change to your network device. It does dramatically speed up playbooks because we're not repeating the same show commands on the device. So if you think of uh, the interface resource module, the L2 interface resource module, and the layer three interface resource module, if you were to use those three modules within a playbook, we'll actually issue the show interface command three different times. If you enable the caching capabilities, we issue that command once. If the configuration change is made, we invalidate the cache and we'll go get it again. So um, narrow, maybe a fairly narrow use case here for a well-controlled production environment where you have a good understanding of your source of truth and the number of systems that are making configuration changes. But if you're in that scenario, I would encourage you to look at single user mode and the caching capabilities that we introduced in NetCommon 2. The second large piece of functionality in NetCommon version 2.0 is something called Ansible Network Import Modules. Uh, this was originally called direct, sec direct Execution, but there were some naming conflicts, so we went with the very verbose Ansible Network Import Modules. This also works for the resource modules. It was implemented in the base class for all of the network resource modules. And what this does, if you think back to, uh, you know, kind of the, the roots of Ansible uh, running against a Linux server, a given module is packaged up, tarred, copied to the Linux host, untarred, and run with a shell. Uh, that's exactly the same way that network modules worked up until three weeks ago we would tar up the module, copy it into the temp directory, untar it, run it with the Python shell command, collect standard out, and bring that back into the Ansible process. If you enable Ansible network import modules, we actually import module, we import the module code directly and bypass the tarring, untarring, uh, and running from the shell. So the module is actually executed in the same process, the same fork, if you will, that the host is running under. Um, it reduces CPU utilization on the control node, as well as can speed up module execution time. So I would encourage you to, uh, that is an opt-in flag. It ended up as a connection flag. So if you're using network CLI, um, you can look at the network CLI or the netconf connection 
documentation to see how enable that. So I would, uh, I'd love some feedback on that one. It's, it's fairly new. It just came out. It's an opt-in. So it's not being, you know, turned on by default. Uh, we would like to turn it on by default, but we won't be able to do that until we get a year, year and a half, two years behind us uh, and really make that the default operating paradigm for the network modules. A little bit of work in the Ansible libssh space, uh, really having to do with SCP and GSS API support in the connection plugin, um, and a little bit of uh, moving around of files uh, within the collection itself, not user impacting changes, it was largely triggered by <clears throat> um, inclusion in Ansible 3.0. We had a sub plugin directory structure uh, that we, we all decided could be cleaner. So it's largely just moving some files around from uh, individual plugin directories to a plugins sub plugins directory. Uh, I mentioned the lib SSH support that goes along with the changes in Netcommon. The other thing I'd like to talk about today is really uh, if anything, an introduction to the Ansible Utils collection. This is a fairly new collection. It went from 1.0 to 2.0 uh, just last fall or this early in January. I don't remember the timing. Um, the Ansible Utils collection is a place where we intend to put plugins that ease uh, data management and data manipulation for playbook developers. Uh, I'll show you couple things that are in here. It was included in Ansible 3.0. Um, the collection has been out for a little bit of time. Sorry, my internet connection is awfully slow. Uh, but some of the plugins you're gonna find in here, uh, filter plugins for uh, getting a path from a large data structure, index of, which is a filter plugin that will let you find the index of a dictionary within a list based on one of the attributes. So, you know, index of um, something equal true. Two paths. Uh, we'll take a large complex data structure and flatten it into um, ginger paths, if you will, dot delimited paths that show, um, uh, that kind of flatten or, or deflate your data structure. Uh, validate is an interesting one. That one is close to close to my heart. Uh, it allows you to use to uh, allows you to use a JSON schema to validate a data structure. So if you have a complex data structure that either originated from a resource module or your inventory or an external REST API or uh, an include of a VARS file and you wanna validate the shape of that data prior to using it within your playbook, you can write a corresponding JSON schema to describe what the shape of the data is, the types of the values within that data, and you can use the validate uh, plugins to compare the data to the schema uh, and error out if necessary. Um, what you're going to notice here is a lot of these filter plugins have also been exposed as lookup plugins. Um, we decided that there was enough use cases for both. They share a common code base underneath, and the filter plugin and the lookup plugin are really just entry points to the common code underneath. The CLI parse module has moved out of NetCommon into the utils uh, collection. Uh, that was done because we've actually got uh, had some feedback that there were use cases outside of networking uh, in, in the Linux space or just the simple parsing of semi-structured text. So that has now been moved to Ansible Utils. There are redirects in place. Uh, so the Ansible net common path will still work while the redirect is there. Fact if uh, shows you the difference between two different facts. Update fact, if you have deeply nested data and you know you wanna update one small attribute of a dictionary within a list, within a list of dictionaries, uh, you can just specify the path the dot delimited path uh, to that nested key and it will update it and return the updated fact. Uh, and then again, the validate module, the validate test plugin uh, and the validate plugin specifically for JSON schema. We have talked about other validation plugins as well that will work with the, the filter plugin and lookup plugin. Uh, I think the first might be um, kind of some network configuration sanity checking to look for things like short interface names. So that uh, you might see that come out in the next few months or so. So uh, I would encourage you to look at the Ansible Utils collection for two different reasons. Um, reason one is I think there's some interesting plugins that may be of use here. Um, and from a pure development standpoint, uh, there was a lot of work that went into the way the code is structured for each of these plugins. Um, they're listed here as modules, but they're actually action plugins. Um, there's some code to do arc spec validation within an action plugin where a module isn't necessary. These modules all run on the control node, uh, so they can actually be entirely coded as an action plugin. 
So some interesting code there. The sharing of common code between filter plugins and lookup plugins uh, and test plugins for that matter, uh, I think is a really neat, if you will, thing to do because there are different places in your playbook where you may want to take advantage of that functionality. It may be within a Jinja template where a test plugin makes sense. Uh, it may be within a set fact where a filter plugin uh, makes more sense. So that is the Ansible Utils collection. Uh, it's like I said, it's still pretty new. So uh, I know there's one or two outstanding small bugs in there that are uh, in progress of being fixed. Uh, let me go back to the document here. And the last thing I wanted to mention this morning is uh, we are building an Ansible.network collection uh, that will not contain any content. So the purpose of the Ansible.network collection is really just to have a dependency file um, Galaxy.yaml file will have dependencies on each of the platform collections, the Ansible Net Common collection, and the Ansible Utils collection. And it's really just a convenience collection for the purpose of uh, doing a group installer. Um, because there are hooks between the platform collections and Ansible Net Common, uh, we wanted a very easy way for somebody to pull down the entirety of the dependency chain for Ansible networking and ensure that the versions were compatible with each other. So if you install the Ansible network collection, you will get each of the platform collections, Ansible network and Ansible utils, and you'll have confidence that they have been tested together and they are version compatible. Uh, I will say today there are no uh, major version incompatibilities between versions of the platform and NetCommon, uh, but we want to make sure that we get this in place before there is. So there is a way to have an assurance that the, the individual collections have been tested and work well together. I think that's it. <laughs> that was everything I wanted to go over this morning. I think I've talked really fast. Um, maybe I'll ask for some some questions now. See if anybody. That, that was really interesting, Brad. It's, it's amazing what the. I used to be in the networking team, and I really can't keep track of all the cool stuff that's going in there now. Um, just as a general reminder, this has been recorded. Uh, we're going to do a blog post, so I know Brad threw a lot of stuff at you and as everyone else has, so we're going to have a load of links and get a, a really good write-up. All of that will include details about the call to action, like what are these new things, how do you test them, how do you give feedback. I would like to say thank you to the 24 people or so that have been voting in the polls. So if when you've got the chat window open on in Google Meet, on the top right, there's a little button that looks like... Oh, God, my eyes are terrible. Uh, triangle uh, square circle. Uh, if you click that and then polls, um, we can do some audience participation. This is useful data for us. It keeps uh, Greg gainfully employed. Uh, means we can do some more graphs and you know take the feedback. Right. One of the things we've been talking about is what are we doing with chat platforms? It's a controversial topic. Give us your feedback there, and we've got one in about. Um, are you resource modules that Bud's just been talking about? Any questions? Yeah. I would just say, yeah, please, please answer that that poll question. Um, there is um, there's a fairly significant development effort that goes into the the defining and the coding and the testing of the resource modules. Um, if you're not using resource modules, um, I would also be curious to know how come. Uh, are they too new? Are they too recent? Uh, do we not have support for the thing uh, that you want to use? And you can throw that in IRC or in chat. Could you describe again what are resource modules? And it, is that similar to cloud modules where you specify creating an instance, for example? Yeah. So the the, the genesis, so if I go back in time, the first implementation of Ansible networking, uh, there were really two, two modules that existed for each of the platforms. There was the command module that would issue a command on the network device, and then there was a config module that would push config to a network device. Um, and when using the command in the config modules, uh, there was a lot of Jinja templating that had to go on uh, to, to to template the configuration that was being pushed. And in order to populate that template, um, you needed to start managing an inventory of key value pairs and dictionaries and list and large data structures. Um, 
and what what we heard from um, several several different directions was the amount of effort that was going into managing the data, uh, parsing configuration to kind of create the data from brownfield configurations and managing uh, fairly complex Jinja templates. Uh, somebody passed along a BGP template, a BGP Jinja template for me, and it was seven different files and over 3,000 lines long for the logic of creating the BGP configuration with a Jinja template. And it was kind of that point in time where we realized um, we can actually do a lot of this heavy lifting of parsing configuration and turning it into structured data. And then in the reverse, taking structured data, turning it back into configuration text, we can actually do that in the module itself. So in short, what a network resource module is, um, they are scoped for an individual chunk of configuration, BGP, OSPF interfaces within a network config. Uh, and they will give you structured data from kind of that old school configuration text. And then they will take structured data in and turn it back into configuration text. So no templating, uh, structured data from the networking device that you can dump right into your inventory and use moving forward. Uh, different states for how you want to make your configurations. Is it just an additive configuration or is it a wholesale placement? That's largely based on uh, where you are in maturity with regard to your kind of source of truth or offloading all of the data on the box. Uh, so structured data in, structured data out. No parsing, no templating. Thank you. Sounds like you made it more Ansible-like. We tried to. <laughs> Great, thanks, Brad. Um, if there are further questions, please feel free to drop them in chat or IRC. Uh, let's keep on schedule with the agenda. The next, we have Derek with help maintaining the Ubuntu PPA. Hi, Hi. thanks, Carol. Uh, let me present here. We see it. All right, cool, thank you. All right, everyone, I am Derek Crago. I'm part of the Ansible community team, and I'm gonna talk about the Ansible Ubuntu PPA, which is one of the things I've been working on recently. So first, um, just kind of go over where we're at. Um, we've got a singular Ansible user in Launchpad. Um, we have a build process in Jenkins, which is internal. And we currently are building kind of a matrix of versions um, depending on the version of Ansible. We're spitting out different versions of uh, Ansible for Ubuntu. And that's kind of based on in Ansible base 2.10 we started uh, requiring this straight plugin, and it's only uh, easily or readily available in Ubuntu uh, 18.04 and greater. So future status and kind of some questions for the community. Oh, and I'll, I should have a lot of time at the end, so um, if you guys want to discuss, that'd be great. Um, so, so kind of some of the things that I've been thinking about and the community's been thinking about is uh, first switching the uh, Launchpad configuration from a single Ansible user to an actual Ansible team. So uh, we wouldn't have to share uh, username and password. We, it would allow the, the team to kind of manage itself. Um, moving the build process from something internal to something more public like a a GitHub action, perhaps. Um, that I have done a little bit of testing on. So I think I think a GitHub action might work. Um, we'll see kind of what everybody else thinks. And then for the versions of Ansible, um, right now, or soon-ish, uh, we're capable of doing 2.9, 2.10, and 3. Um, you know, once we kind of turn this over to more of a community-based uh, build. Do we want to just build the latest? Do we want to build the latest minus N? I know Toshio is going to be talking uh, kind of around that same topic later. So, 
something to kind of keep in the back of your mind. And then for Ubuntu itself, um, which versions do we want to build? Like I mentioned earlier, um, 18.04 and greater are kind of required for 2.10 and, and beyond, unless we want to go through um, some more effort to get the uh, Python modules to work or maybe do some of our own packaging. Um, again, it's kind of what the, the community wants to, to bite off. So um, again, I guess just going over that, uh, do we want to stick with the LTSs and then the like current release? Um, and how far back do we want to go for like Ansible 2.9 if we decide that we're going to continue to, to build that? According to Launchpad, um, it goes, you know, support would go clear back to 1204, which I, I think is actually just a incorrect response from their API, because as far as I can tell, 1204 uh, is no longer supported. But I mean, you could theoretically say uh, 1404, which we, we do have two nine builds for at the moment. And then um, obviously 2104 is coming soon, should be next month or so. So, um, you know, where we're looking for feedback from the community is um, the launchback configuration. Uh, do you think it makes sense to move from the single user to a team? Is there something else that you think might work? Um, the build process, uh, moving it from Jenkins to something else, potentially a, a GitHub action, or, uh, you know, uh, ideas around that. Um, what versions of Ansible do we want to build for? Uh, what versions of Ubuntu do we want to build for? Um, really just any questions or, or comments around, you know, getting this to be a more uh, community maintained project. So if you're interested in, in helping, um, you know, join the community IRC meetings. Uh, they're Wednesdays at uh, 19 UTC. You can message me directly on IRC. Um, Derek Crago, uh, same with my GitHub. Um, that's basically it. So if we've got any questions, comments, thoughts, I'm all ears. Thanks, Derek. Any questions or comments? Uh, no, no questions for me, Derek. Thanks. Um, I, do, I do have a comment, though. Um, I, I, f I feel in regards to packaging, uh, the, the work on a PPA is great. Uh, I, I, but we also need to think about other distros. Uh, Debian, Fedora comes to mind. Um, I, uh, at some point we, um, we ended up putting the ball in their court, you know, for packaging and we, it, we should, we should try to make it, um, I don't know, easier to package in general. Uh, you know, we, we have, we have a process with Ansible to build the, the release and the tarball and then, um, there's different approaches too, like Fedora, for example, I've heard about um, a motivation to package uh, Ansible base or Ansible core individually, and then have individual packages for all of the collections. So then when you install Ansible, it installs the core and then packages for each collection. I'm not saying we should do that for every distro. Um, that I think it depends on you know, the guidelines for you know, packaging bundles and stuff like that. There's some, you know, licensing gotchas too um, that I, I, I don't want to get into the weeds of. But um, in general, if there's any people interested in um, helping with the packaging, I'm also all ears. Um, 
I, I, I've been meeting to talk with Kevin Fenzi from Fedora, uh, who has been working on the Ansible package there um, to try and help out, because I know that uh, Fedora is still running on 2.9. I mean, do you have something to add? Uh, well, I, I had a question. And is the GitHub action that you have been talking about, is it available now? Is the repository available? Uh, so I've been doing that out of my own, um, it's a public repo, but out of my own personal repo and publishing to my own uh, personal PPA to just kind of test with. I can certainly link to that, um, but by no means is it official. Great. Yeah, I'll throw the link in the chat. Is the lack of a PPA causing problems for the people on here? Is it, I'll put it enough way. Who, who's desperately waiting for the for the PPA so they don't have to build from source or or use the um, Python package? No one. Cool. So we don't need to do this then. That's I'm not sure if the developers are the right. I would say public to ask if they are waiting for the PPA. We just git clone the thing out of devil. So that's a, that's a really good point. Thank you. Yeah, I should always be mindful of the audience. Derek, there's a question on IRC about what is sorry on on Google Chat. Sorry, Google Chat um, about any notes or specific asks of how people can help. So I guess um, we're, we're still in the trying to determine how to move forward phase, um, kind of in combination with, I think, what Toshi is going to talk about later in terms of, you know, what are we going to build um, in the future? So I um, maybe a couple of things, right? So uh, if, if it is, if people are looking for maybe not the latest build, then potentially someone who might be able to help with building uh, the like n minus one releases, um, or or you know if they're interested in something specific that we're not doing, um, help with that. I, I think uh, eventually we'd like to get to a place where this is kind of self-maintained um, by the community. So uh, that was one of the reasons I thought that having the Ansible user uh, migrated to a team so that we, in Launchpad that is, so that we could uh, invite people to, to, to join that team and to, to kind of take ownership over the project. So I guess specifics, not yet, um, unless you think that the, Launchpad approach is uh, not a good idea. <laughs> In which case, we're looking for feedback. Well, you know, one of the questions that I was asked at some point was, um, why, why even, why even a PPA in the first place? Like, why does not, why does Ubuntu not pull from Debian, which already packages uh, Ansible, for example? And I, I don't, I don't use a lot of Debian and Ubuntu in my day to day, so I don't know, you know. Uh, is Debian out of date or anything like that? I, I don't like. What are the incentives for for having a PPA in the first place? Debian is definitely out of date. Um, one way that we could solve this is to talk to the Debian maintainers and see if we can what we can do to get them, you know, the ability to make up to date packages in the backports repo. Uh, we have talked to the Debian maintainers briefly several times in the past. Uh, but it's never really had staying power. I get the, the feeling that they're doing a lot of other things, the, the specific people who are currently maintaining the Ansible package there. Uh, so, you know, it, it could be we need to build up, you know, a different set of maintainers or something. Um, but it seems like right here we don't have the right people you know, no Debian maintainers inside of this group here um, to help us do that. 
Yeah, the, the chat is saying that Debian, the latest version of Debian stable is running on 2.7, which is already end of life. So yeah. Yep. And yeah. just just to FYI, I put a link in the chat to uh, what I've currently been doing to to test the GitHub action to PPA builds. Thanks, Derek. Uh, we are at the 15 minute uh, mark for, for your session. So um, thanks for sharing that and uh, the great discussions. Let's move on to Sandra with documentation split, Ansible versus Ansible core. 